Hello, today we're going to talk about the thoracic spine or dorsal spine as it's sometimes called and its radiographic position. Let's do a quick review of the anatomy of a thoracic vertebra. So remember there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. Uh, they occupy the posterior thorax and they have some very unique features. They've got what are called costal facets on the posterior and the lateral sides of the body and this is for the articulation with the head of the ribs. Remember the ribs attach to your thoracic vertebrae. So the head of the rib attaches to the lateral side of the body and then the vertebra also has facets on the transverse processes for articulations with the tubercle of the ribs. That would be for all of them except for T11 and T12. So you have a facet on the body for the head of the rib and a facet on the transverse process for the tubercle of the rib. There's a diagram you can look also in your book. Uh, let's just go over some of the parts really quick. Remember most anterior of course is the body. Notice on the body I'm looking at the uh, diagram on the left the superior aspect. Notice then you've got superior costal facets uh, that are on the body itself. Then you've got the transverse process. Remember the transverse process, you also have another facet on there. That's for the tubercle of the rib, just as I mentioned. Of course, between the uh, body and then the lamina, you've got the pedicle. You've got the two transverse processes that are coming out to the sides, and then you've got the spinous process. If we look at the lateral, what you'll notice then is the spinous process uh, for your thoracic vertebrae are almost inclined uh, caudally uh, as opposed to the uh, other areas of the spine. So they take a very steep caudal angulation. You can see also on this lateral uh, the uh, areas where the ribs will uh, attach to the vertebrae. Uh, here you've got the superior costal facet and then the inferior costal facet and a facet for the costal while we're looking at this, I would like uh, to remind you that in your book, in Merrill's, there is a table, and in the 13th edition, the table is uh, table 8-2. And what is of importance here is that you have the vertebrae that are listed, a T1, T2 to T8, T9, and T10 to T12. What's important about those is some of your vertebrae have what are called whole facets, which basically is an accommodation for the entire head of one rib. And then you've got demi facets, which are uh, almost half of the size of the uh, whole facets. And this is for an accommodation of a, the head of a rib above and the vertebra immediately below. So T1 has a whole facet and a demi facet. T2 to T8 has a demi facet superiorly and a demi facet inferiorly. T9 has a superior demi facet but no inferior demi facet. And T10 to T12, they don't have uh, any inferior uh, facets, but superiorly they have a whole facet. So that table is very important for you to uh, know which vertebrae have whole facets versus demi facets. As far as preparation is concerned for a thoracic spine, patient preparation for middle to lower vertebral column procedures requires the removal of artifacts from the anatomy of interest, uh, any necklaces, any clothing artifacts, a bra for example for a female, uh, make sure you have everything from the waist up off and then have the person put on a hospital gown. So you've given them the gown, secure the patient possessions in a designated manner and location within the room. General patient position, ambulatory patients can be done upright or recumbent, non-ambulatory, alter your position to maximize patient comfort. And in a trauma situation, you're going to move the image receptor and the central ray to obtain images to maximize patient safety. So they give you a uh, page in chapter 13 to take a look at. 
For the IR collimated field size, the textbook will give you guidelines. We're going to use, of course, the smallest IR that will demonstrate the anatomy, and you're going to collimate the field size to the anatomy of interest. SID will be standardized as part of the procedural protocol. Generally, 40-inch SID is going to be used. For ID markers, right or left side markers must be included on each image. Avoid using digital annotation to put side markers on the images. Remember, we want to use our lead markers. Other required ID markers must be in the blocker or elsewhere on the final image. For radiation protection, you're going to shield pediatric patients and patients of reproductive age. Uh, volume 1, pages 33 to 34, uh, edition 13. You can take a look at that. Other radiation protection measures, close collimation, and optimum technique factors need to be utilized. For patient instructions, explain procedures, positions, breathing instructions. Respiration is suspended during most uh, middle to lower vertebral column projections. Thoracic spine procedures can use breathing technique to blur lung and rib anatomy. There are basically two essential projections for the T-spine, which will be an AP and a lateral, but as you'll see, there's often then a third projection that is done for the upper cervical thoracic region, which we refer to as the swimmers. So for the AP T-spine, the patient position can be supine or upright. The shoulders are in the same horizontal plane, arms are by the patient's side. MSP is in the center. If they're supine and they have kyphosis, you can reduce that kyphosis by flexing the hips and knees to place the thighs vertical. Uh, if upright, weight should be equally distributed on both feet. And the IR is placed one and a half to two inches above the shoulders to place T7 in the center of your radiograph. The central ray is perpendicular to the IR and enters the patient halfway between the jugular notch and the xiphoid process. So halfway between the jugular notch and the xiphoid process. And you're going to use a very narrow collimated field, but a long field, 7 by 17 inches. For the lateral of the T-spine, the T-spine intervertebral foramina are demonstrated on the lateral projection. T-spine zygopophyseal joints are shown on the obliques. I want to draw your attention to page 371 of Merrill's, and of course I'm looking at the 13th edition. Table 8-1 is crucial for you to memorize all of the information on table 8-1, page 371, table 8-1, very, very crucial to memorize. All of this information will be on the registry. So what does this uh, table give to you? Well, it lists the three areas of the spine, the cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar. It then lists intervertebral foramina, and it lists zygopophyseal joints. We've already learned the lumbar spine, and we saw that in the lumbar spine, the intervertebral foramina are demonstrated on the lateral projection. If we look at the table, the thoracic spine, it too demonstrates the intervertebral foramina on the lateral. So for both the T-spine and the lumbar, the intervertebral foramina are demonstrated on the lateral projections. I want you to now look at the zygopophyseal joints. We've learned the lumbar already, and we've learned that we're going to do 30 to 60 degree obliques. Most places do 45. If we're doing AP obliques, we are demonstrating the zygopophyseal joints on the side that is down. So if I am doing an RPO, I am demonstrating the zygopophyseal joints on the right side. PA, it would be opposite. I'm demonstrating the zygopophyseal joints on the side up. Now look at the table and I want you to notice the zygopophyseal joints for the T-spine. When you look at this, notice these are very steep oblique, 70 degrees. But what's of interest here is that in the lumbar spine, the AP demonstrated the zygopophyseal joints on the side that is down, whereas on the T-spine, the oblique, the AP oblique, 
AP projection demonstrates the zygopophyseal joint on the side up. So notice the difference. Lumbar, AP side down. Thoracic, AP side up. And then, of course, it would be just the reverse for the uh, PA uh, obliques as well. So there's the difference. Uh, lumbar spine obliques, zygopophyseal joints for AP side down. For T-spine, zygopophyseal joints AP side up. Let's take a look at the lateral. The lateral uh, patient position, recumbent or upright. Left lateral minimizes heart magnification and overlapping of the heart on the spine. So most of the time we do the left lateral. The other reason for the left lateral, if you're putting the patient on the table, uh, if they turn to the left, what you're going to be able to see then is the patient's uh, thoracic spine. If you uh, maintain modesty, but with a sheet, lift up the gown a little bit, you're able to see the uh, T-spine itself. And of course, you're going to always make sure that you're getting that T-spine uh, to be parallel with the table if the patient is in a recumbent position. So part position, long axis of vertebral column, aligned horizontal, firm support for head and lower portion if needed. If recumbent, flex the knees uh, and the hips for comfort. You're going to superimpose the hips and knees for a true lateral position, and you're going to adjust the arms to a right angle from the body. Central ray is perpendicular to the IR if the spine is horizontal. How would you get the spine horizontal? Well, hopefully if it wasn't, you put some sponges under the lower thoracic region. Um, but however, if you did that and it's still not uh, horizontal, uh, then you can angle 10 to 15 degrees in a cephalid uh, direction. And your central ray is going to enter the patient at T7, which remember is the inferior angles of the scapula, that level of the inferior angles of the scapula. Once again, you're still using a, a very narrow, long collimated field, 7 by 17. Oftentimes you're going to see that text will put a lead behind the patient's back. This is going to help absorb scatter radiation. When we do the AP and we do the lateral, on the AP we can see all 12 thoracic vertebrae. However, when we do the lateral, we are not going to be seeing the upper uh, thoracic vertebrae because in the lateral position, the shoulders are going to obscure the upper thoracic vertebrae. So we need to do what is called a lateral or a swimmer's technique. Um, you'll see that this in the book is actually part of the cervical routine, but most places will incorporate this also for the uh, T-spine for the cervical thoracic area. And as it's noted here in the box, this projection is needed when C7 is not well demonstrated on the lateral C-spine projection, but also, as I mentioned, when the upper uh, thoracic vertebrae are not seen due to the shoulders, we also do the swimmer's projection. So for the swimmers, uh, upright seated or standing in a true lateral position, recumbent true lateral position with head resting on the arm or a firm support. So if they're lying down, you raise the patient's arm, uh, the dependent arm that they're lying on, and uh, raise it above the head, and they're going to lie their head on that arm. MCP is centered to the midline of the grid. Uh, extend the arm closer to the IR above the head, rotate the humeral head anteriorly. So we're trying to keep the patient in a lateral position. We're going to roll the humeral head anteriorly. If they're upright, we're going to flex the elbow and rest the forearm on the head. We're going to depress the shoulder farther from the IR if possible. So we're going to bring the one arm up the other arm down, and then we're going to roll the head of the humerus anteriorly. What we're doing then is we're trying to get as much as possible the heads of the humeri out of the way of the vertebrae. It's tricky because we want to keep the head and the body in a true lateral position. You should see C7 to T1 interspace in the center of your image. 
Tensile ray is perpendicular to C7 T1 inner space if the shoulder is away from the IR uh, that's depressed. If the shoulder cannot be depressed, you're going to angle 3 to 5 degrees in a caudal direction. And we're going to use a 10 by 12 inch collimated field. We want to see evidence of proper collimation, adequate x ray penetration through the shoulder region demonstrating the lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebra not appreciably rotated from the lateral position. The humeral heads will be minimally superimposed on the vertebral column and we should see soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. Here's a good image of the uh, swimmers. And what we're seeing is uh, C6, C7 is going to have usually a clavicle over it. And then you've got then, uh, of course, T1. Uh, what I'd like you to notice too, look at the, uh, the clavicle. Okay, you've got one, almost looks like to me like a wishbone kind of. You've got a clavicle going up and then a clavicle uh, going down. These are well labeled in your book, so I'd like you to make sure that you look at that. But you can see then you're going to have superimposition uh, by, the, by the clavicles, but uh, pretty much then you've got then uh, the area uh, that you're looking for in the center of your image um, and hopefully you've used a, a technique that's going to allow for good penetration. As far as the criteria when you're going to look at these uh, images for the APT spine, proper collimation. Of course, you have to have all 12 thoracic vertebrae. All the vertebrae are shown with uniform brightness and contrast, or you may have to take two radiographs for an upper and lower uh, vertebrae. Generally with digital imaging today, you don't have to do that with film. You had to do that sometimes. And there's no rotation as demonstrated by the spinous processes at the midline of the vertebral bodies. Vertebral column aligned to the middle of the radiograph. Soft tissue and bony trabecular detail are seen. Ribs, shoulders, lungs, and diaphragm if a full heel projection is made. In some institutions, they want to see um, for the AP, almost a, a full chest, basically. Here's a image of the APT spine. You can see C7 up at the top there. You'll know that's C7 because there's no rib attached to it. Um, and then you've got all of the other uh, vertebrae then. Uh, and you can see they're all uh, there with the uh, rib attachments. For the lateral of the T-spine, evidence of proper collimation, posterior field, a shielding to reduce scatter, to the posterior structures of the spine, and the vertebrae are clearly seen through the rib and the lung shadows. Excuse me. And um, basically then you can see also the disc spaces between the vertebrae themselves.